Good evening Year 11 and welcome to your night before uh, video. This time it's physics in preparation for your exam tomorrow and we will be looking at the two required practicals acceleration and the radiation and absorption of infrared radiation. So the acceleration practical. Uh, there are actually two parts to this experiment and you could be given questions on either or potentially both. So part one involves the effect of changing the force that is causing the acceleration whilst maintaining an object of constant mass. The second part of the experiment involves changing the mass when an object is being accelerated by a constant force. Both experiments can be completed with the same apparatus and you may recall when you did this experiment you did them both back to back on the same day. So for the acceleration experiment the equipment that you are likely to have seen already and used involves as you can see from the diagram here a trolley with a piece of card connected to it, a runway for the trolley to run on, in our case we used our desks. There's a weight hanger attached to a pulley at the end of the desks which then could fall down to the floor and there was a light gate connected to a data logger. Now in the setup process you would have to set up the data logger so that it knew exactly how wide the pieces of card are that, that, that are going to pass through the light gate because what it will do is measure the card as it passes through the light gate and then it will measure the second half of the card as that passes through the light gate it will automatically work out the, the speed or velocity of both sections of card and from that it can then calculate the acceleration for you so it is important that if you're using a piece of card like that the uh, card is as symmetrical as possible so that you only have one value to program into your data logger the experiment can also be set up using two light gates and a single piece of card so that the first light gate triggers when the car initially passes through it and the second light gate triggers a few seconds later when the card passes through that one and again it needs to be programmed with the width of the piece of card and it will then calculate the speed and then the acceleration for you. So the data logger is programmed to do all of those things. So you could do, you can use this one for either method. Now, in order to do the first part of the experiment, we need to have a trolley and weight hanger arrangement with a constant mass. So to start with, we have our 500 gram masses one of them is placed on the weight hanger as you can see here the other four are placed on the trolley that means the total mass of the whole system the trolley plus the mass hanger remains constant uh, the trolley will need to be held uh, otherwise it will start accelerating by itself so somebody needs to hold on to it and it's important that you always start it from a fixed distance away from the light gate so measure out a fixed distance using a ruler so that, and draw a start line across the bench so you can always have your trolley starting from the same point. The second thing that has to happen and this is something to check in the setup is that the trolley must pass through the light gate before the weight hanger hits the floor because the moment it hits the floor it's no longer providing an accelerating force. So you may need to adjust the apparatus to ensure that that happens. Now, you are going to then release the trolley and allow, it, allow the weight hanger to pull the trolley forwards through the light gate and the data logger will calculate the acceleration of the trolley for you. Uh, it's always a good idea to repeat this process at least twice, ideally three times, before moving on to the next value. Uh, from there, you just take one of the masses from the trolley and you stick it onto the weight hanger, thus increasing the pulling force, but maintaining the total mass of the system as a constant. And you repeat that process 
until all five of the masses are on the hanger and there are none on the trolley. As mentioned previously, you can then repeat that experiment at least twice uh, so that you can identify any anomalies and you can calculate a mean. So, for this version of the experiment, the accelerating force was our independent variable and our acceleration was our dependent variable and the mass of the system as a whole was a control variable as was the distance between the light gate and the starting point for the trolley. For the second part of the experiment, the setup is exactly the same, but this time we are going to be using a fixed force to pull the trolley along by adding a certain number of masses to the weight hanger. And then we are going to be changing the mass of the trolley by adding 100 gram masses um, one at a time and recording the acceleration for each one. Again, as previously, everything is set up on the data logger. The trolley is held at the same fixed distance away from the light gate and the mass hanger has to hit the floor after the trolley has completely made it through the light gate. In this case, the mass of the trolley is our independent variable. The acceleration is our dependent variable still, but the, the force that's accelerating it this time is a control variable. So again, pick a suitable value or have a suitable value chosen to go on the mass hanger and then add masses to the trolley to increase its mass in regular intervals, 100 grams is a good suggestion. Once you've completed both parts of the experiment, you can then uh, analyse the results by plotting a graph. So for the first experiment, you, are, you change the force and you were recording the acceleration. So you want to be plotting a graph of force against acceleration. Now you should recall Newton's second law uh, and the equation for Newton's second law, F equals M times A, force equals mass times acceleration. The acceleration is therefore directly proportional to the resultant force that is acting on it. And any time you have a relationship that is directly proportional, you should find that you get a straight line graph that goes through the origin, as you can see here. When there's no force being applied, there is no acceleration, the trolley doesn't move. And as you increase the force, the acceleration increases in a linear way. For the second experiment, where we were changing the mass, if we rearrange the equation for Newton's second law, you can see that acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass of the object. And so when you plot those results, you will get a curved graph like the one shown here. Mass is the independent variable on the horizontal axis. Acceleration is on the vertical axis. Now, if you're asked to prove that this relationship is uh, inversely proportional, what you need to do is to pick a minimum of two, ideally three points that are on the curve. Take the mass value for those points, take the acceleration value for those points and multiply the two numbers together. And for each set of points that you pick, you should always get the same answer. And that answer will be the size of the force that you had driving the trolley. So that's the acceleration practical. The second, the second required practical we're going to be looking at is the radiation and absorption of infrared radiation and how the colour of a surface affects its ability to either emit or to absorb infrared radiation. Again, this experiment can potentially become in two parts. You could get questions on either part or both. An important point to note about infrared radiation is that we cannot see infrared radiation, but we can feel it and we feel it as heat. 
We can also uh, build devices such as thermal imaging cameras that can detect infrared radiation and then display a picture in the visible part of the spectrum so that we can see it. Now, for the first part of this experiment, we are going to use a device called a Leslie cube. As you can see from the picture here, a Leslie cube has sides that are different colours. Uh, there is a white side that's relatively shiny, there is a shiny black side, a matte dull black side, and then a shiny silver side. You may remember seeing the can. Uh, the top surface and the bottom surface are not as important in terms of their colours, but we generally stand the Leslie cube on a heat proof mat that prevents the uh, energy escaping through the table. Now, we want to have some sort of infrared detector. A thermal imaging camera is great for this because that enables you to see it very clearly, but it could be something like a digital temperature probe or some other device that is able to detect infrared radiation. Now, in order to conduct this experiment, uh, we first need to fill the Leslie cube up with boiling water, so we will need a kettle. Uh, fill it all the way up to the top once it's positioned on the heat proof mat and place the lid on it and give it a couple of moments for it to settle. And you will notice that uh, you can actually feel uh, the energy being released from the Leslie cube. Now, you have to work quite quickly with this. By positioning the thermal imaging camera or the infrared detector at a fixed distance away from either side of the cube, you can get a measurement for the amount of infrared radiation that is being emitted by the different sides of the cube. Now, from the safety point of view, it's very, very important that you do not touch the Leslie cube once the boiling water is inside of it. It does get extremely hot and if you touch it, you will burn yourself. Uh, you can place your hands a few centimetres away from the sides and you will also be able to feel the thermal energy being released. You will also be able to feel the difference between the different sides. In situations where a Leslie cube isn't available, this experiment can also be repeated by using uh, cans such as a baked bean tin that have been painted in different colours. So you can have them painted black, painted white, you can have them with no labels on so they're just exposed on the shiny silver surfaces and it has the same effect. You can measure the amount of infrared radiation that's being emitted by them. Part two of the experiment involves using a heat source such as a Bunsen burner or an electric heater to be a source of infrared radiation and placing uh, different coloured materials a fixed distance away from it. In the case of the example we have on the diagram here, you can see there is a ball bearing stuck to the back of the panel using a piece of wax. It could also be done using a thermometer, which will give you an accurate temperature reading or a temperature probe. Now, as the different surfaces absorb different amounts of infraradiation, in this case, the wax begins to melt. The side that absorbs the most infrared radiation will cause the wax to melt the quickest and the ball bearing will drop off. If you have thermometers, the side that absorbs the most infrared radiation will obviously cause a bigger rise in temperature. Again, it's important that you don't touch the metal surfaces whilst the experiment is uh, being conducted. And I would recommend not placing your hand in between the metal surfaces and where the heater is, as it can get potentially extremely hot. So when looking at the results for the Leslie cube experiment, uh, you will discover that the matte black surface is the best emitter of infrared radiation, closely followed by the shiny black surface, then the shiny white surface, or the matte white surface, depending on which one the Leslie cube has got, and the shiny silver surface will be the worst emitter of infrared radiation. So if you're looking at a thermal imaging camera, 
the blacks, the matte black side will show a higher temperature, the shiny silver side will show a lower temperature. Um, if you're using cans, the same effect can be observed. For the second experiment, using the heater and the plates, again, you'll notice that it is the darker matte surface that is the best absorber of infrared radiation, and it will therefore heat up the most. The light shiny surfaces are the worst absorbers, and that is because they reflect most of the infrared radiation. Remember, infrared radiation is just a wave, the same way that visible light is, and it can be reflected, particularly by a shiny surface. So in the case of this experiment, the darker and the flatter the matter the surface is, the better it is at both emitting and absorbing infrared radiation. The lighter and the shinier the surface is, the worse it is at absorbing and emitting infrared radiation. Now this has some very uh, useful practical applications that you will have come across in day-to-day -day life, um, maybe without even realising it. So I'm just going to run through a couple of examples of things that you may have come across. So firstly, a thermos flask for keeping your drinks in. The inside is coated with a shiny silver material. Shiny silver surfaces are very good at reflecting infrared radiation, but not allowing it to travel through them. So as the hot liquid inside tries to radiate heat outwards, the infrared radiation is reflected back into the flask and therefore keeping it hot. It also works with cold drinks because the, sh the shiny silver surface reflects heat from the outside away to stop it from actually getting into your cold drink, thus keeping your drink cold. Um, for those of you that have had the joy of holidaying in the Mediterranean, um, traditionally, buildings in those parts of the world where it's very, very hot are painted white. Uh, that is to reflect as much infrared radiation as possible, and it helps to keep the houses cool in the summer. Um, this was obviously something they discovered before they invented air conditioning. Now, a couple of other closer to home things you may have come across. Um, radiators uh, sometimes can have silvered foil placed behind them. The silver foil is there to reflect the infrared radiation that the radiator is emitting back into the room rather than letting it be absorbed by the walls because you want to heat up the air in the room and therefore keep warm yourself rather than heating up the walls in your house. Um, and a bit less practical but still something that people have tried, um, Paint can be made to be either a very good absorber of infrared radiation. In the case, uh, the example here is a paint called Vanta Black that BMW used to paint one of their M3 cars. And as you can see, it made it very, very difficult to see even when it had spotlights shone on it because it absorbs over 99% of the radiation that hits it. That's not just infrared, that's visible light as well. Other uses for uh, shiny surfaces and dark colored surfaces include uh, mirrors on the back of satellites to reflect sunlight so that the camera equipment can be kept cool rather than being exposed to the glaring heat of the sun. And something you will definitely be familiar with, uh, particularly at this time of year, is that if you are wearing your blazer and your jumper and you're standing around outside in the sunshine, you will find that you get very much hotter than you do if you're just standing outside in your shirt sleeves. Your jumper and your blazer are very dark. They will absorb the infrared radiation from the sun, which will cause you to heat up. Your shirts are a much lighter color they will reflect more of the infrared radiation, therefore you will stay cooler. If you recall way back in year seven, eight and nine when you wore a white shirt, that was even better at reflecting radiation than your blue one. Anyway, that's it for this evening. Good luck with your exams tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>